Welcome to Hively Avenue Mennonite Church, where our mission is to know and make known God's love as we joyfully follow Jesus into the world. No matter who you are, where you come from, or where you are in your journey, may you be immersed in this love and share in this joy. Please join me in prayer. God of every place, some of us see you today from mountains of joy and confidence, mountains of gratitude and praise. Some of us seek you today from valleys of grief or doubt, valleys of loss or exhaustion. And in all places, there you are with us, nudging us onward. When we descend from the heights, show us your presence on the ground. When we rise from the depths, show us the light of your way. Meet us all on the path made by Jesus. Please turn to number 29 in the hymnal as Chris comes to lead us. Number 68 is our hymn of the month. We have sung it in English and we've sung it in Zulu. And today we're going to sing it in Shona as well. When we sing in languages other than our own, we're recognizing our kinship with Christians all over the world. We do our best to pronounce these languages well, but we will make mistakes and that's okay. We do this to honor our God, who has created a family of many people and many languages. Please repeat after me, then Chris will lead us. We're going to look at the Shona, and that's what we'll be singing first. So I'll say a phrase, and you can say it back to me. Hakuna wakaita sa Jesu. Hakuna wakaita sa Jesu. Hakuna. Wakaita Sayay. 
Hakuna Wakaita Saye. Hakuna Wakaita Sajesu. Hakuna Wakaita Sajesu. Haku Haku China. Haku Haku China. Damanya Manya. Damanya Manya. Quese Quese. Quese Quese. Datente Rera Quese. Datente Rera Quese. Dat Svaka Svaka. Quese, 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 quese. Haku, haku, China. Haku, haku, China. Let's stand to. Join me in this longer, complete version of our Peace Candle Litany, which also includes our confession. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. Today, we light this candle as a reminder of our calling.
We rejoice that we are not alone in our calling to make peace. This candle is a gift to us from the Eigenhain Mennonite Church in Saskatchewan. They too light a peace candle each week, as do hundreds of other congregations throughout Russia, England, Germany, the Netherlands, Korea, Tanzania, Taiwan, Canada, and the United States. These people are your people, and they are with us. For the community of peacemakers worldwide, and for your presence, which binds us together, we give you thanks. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. But often we forget our calling and we refuse to do the hard work of making peace. We ask for your forgiveness and for your strength as we try again. We light this candle as a reminder May the passion for peace burn in our hearts. May the light of your justice shine forth in our actions, and may our footsteps in the world leave prints of mercy, grace, and love. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. To your calling, we say yes. And now would the children come forward? Greg will be sharing a special story that Beth chose for you. Good morning. What Beth would want me to tell you, because her name is in the bulletin, is that really she's feeling quite fine, but out of an abundance of caution, she's not here with us this morning because she's very sick. But I think she's better. Okay, this morning I want to read you a story, and after it's done, we can talk about it, okay? But I'm going to say a couple of things, but I'm going to explain a couple things that will help you understand the story better. And some of you may know this, but just in case you don't. Hens are female chickens that lay eggs, and they make a sound that goes kind of like cluck, 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 cluck. The roosters are male chickens, and when they crow, it sounds like cock a doo doo That's right. <laughs> Roosters are usually bigger than the hens, and they help to protect them. Owls are also in the bird family, but they look... And act different than chickens. They crow. Uh, uh, no. Because they can fly high, they live in the forest, and they make a sound like... Do you know what else? Ooh, ooh. Okay. So... Here's the name of our story is cock a doodle hoo I've read that story. You have? Me too. Oh my goodness. Well, this was the first time I read it. I really like it. Good, good. I do too. So fun. Yes. One stormy night, an owl walked into a farmyard. He was cold, lost, and lonely with no place to go. So he squeezed through this hole in the shed. Where? Right, see this little hole? It was warm and cozy in there when he got in the barn, and he fell fast asleep. In the morning, Owl woke to a nip and a pinch. He heard clucking and squawking. He was surrounded by bony feet and beady eyes. He was in a hen house. He's 
no hen. He's no rooster. We need a rooster, is what the chickens were saying. And he just goes, whoo. We, this speckled chicken is a little kinder. She says, we could give him a try. Can he peck like a rooster, said one bossy hen. Owl tried to peck, but he didn't have a very good beak. Can he scratch like a rooster? Owl tried to scratch. Can he cock-a-doodle-doo like a rooster? Owl tried cock-a-doodle-doo, but what came out? What a loser. He'll have to go. But the nice chicken said, oh, who, who, cried the owl sadly. He liked the warm and cozy hen house in the yard dappled with spring sunshine. The speckled hen, the kind of kinder one, put her bony wings around him. I'll teach you how to be a rooster, she clucked. And she did. Al learned how to march up and down, guard the hen house, and puff out his feathers. He was doing very well. Until the other hen said, try and cock-a-doodle-doo. Al tried very hard. He tried his best. But he was an owl after all, and he just hooted like an owl. Woo! The other hands were not impressed. A rooster must cock a doodle doo. All he does is hoot. Owl got cross. It had enough. He was hungry and he was fed up with the silly hands. So he said, I'm an owl, not a fowl. A fowl is another name for a bird family. Owls aren't hens. We hoot in the moonlight. We don't peck corn. We catch, we catch rats, squawked a hen peering into the hen house. See this rat coming in? A rat, a rat is in our hen house. The rat was stealing eggs, eating corn, chasing chicks. When Owl heard this, he pricked up his little ear tufts, he flexed his sharp claws, and stretched his soft wings. Then silently, as a floating feather, he flew across the hen house. Snap! Snap! He caught the rat, gobbled it up. The rat was tasty and delicious. The hens were speechless. And, and Al puffed out his chest with a swagger and shouted, cock a doodle hoo <laughs> our very own special rooster, our hero, a rat-catching owl. And see, now he's part of the farm family. But look, the farmer, he looks really, really surprised. <laughs> So, okay, I have a couple questions. How did the hens treat the owl when he first came? Bad. 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 Yes. They didn't make him feel very welcome, did they? No. He was different than them, and they wanted him to act like a chicken. Did it work for the owl to act like a chicken? No. 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 He couldn't do it. But when they were scared of the rat and the owl caught the rat, then they decided the owl could help to protect them. And they welcomed the owl to their farm. You know, sometimes we are a little like the hens. We want other kids and people to be like us. But then we miss out on discovering we are each special and have different gifts and ways of living. And this is very true for all of Hively, especially you children. You come from many different countries. Um, 
and see all those different flags. Maybe you speak some different languages at home. So, but to be friends, it is important. Yes, you're talking about how you have lived in another country, right? Yes, it's important to, li to be friends. It's important to listen so we can learn about each other and become better friends. And that's true at school or in our neighborhood besides at church. So in Pastor Jake's sermon, he's going to talk about Paul and how he needed to first listen and be a friend before he could talk to the people about God. So let's pray. Thank you that each of us is special, dear God. Help us when we meet new children at church, school, and the neighborhood to open our hearts so that they can learn about God by us being friends with them. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I'll be reading Acts 17, 16 through 31 from the New International Version, and Juan will be reading the Spanish. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Uh, 
I'll be reading um, Acts 17, 60-31 in Spanish. Mientras Pablo los esperaba en Atenas, le dolió en el alma ver a la ciudad estaba llena de ídolos. Así que, dis que discutía en, el, en la sinagoga con los demás judíos y con los griegos que adoraban a Dios. Y a diario hablaba en la plaza con los que se encontraban como por allá. Algunos filósofos epicureos y históricos entablaron conversación con él. Unos decían que qué, qué querrá decir ese charlatán. Otros comentaban, parece que es predicador de dioses extranjero. Decían, es porque Pablo les anunciaba la buena nuevas de Jesús y que en la resurrección entonces se lo llevaron en la reunión a Areopago. Se puede saber ¿Qué, ¿Qué nueva enseñanza es para usted, que usted presenta? Le preguntaron, ¿por qué no viene usted con esas ideas que nos suenan extrañas y queremos saber qué significan? Es que todos los atenientes a los extranjeros que vivían allá se pasaron el tiempo sin hacer ninguna cosa para hacer escuchar y comentar los, las últimas novedades. Pablo se puso en medio de Areopago y Torón, y Torón la palabra. Ciudadanos atenientes, observe que, su, que ustedes son sumamente religiosos en todo lo que hacen. Al pasar firmemente en sus lugares sagrados, encontré incluso con un altar con que esta inscripción de Dios fue desconocido. Pues bien, eso es lo que adoran como algo desconocido en lo que yo les anuncio. El que Dios hizo el mundo y todo lugar, hay que el Señor del cielo y la tierra no vive en templos construidos por hombres, ni se deja servir por manos humanas como si necesitara de algo. Por el contrario, es él la de los de la vida y el alimento de las cosas de un solo hombre. Fien hizo dejar una de las naciones para que habitaran toda la tierra. Determinó la pérdida de su historia de la frontera de, las, de su territorio. Por tanto, siendo descendiente de Dios, no debemos pensar que la divinidad sea como el oro, la plata, la piedra, escultura hecha por resultados del ingeniero de la destreza del ser humano y por lo tanto pues Dios pasó por aquello que de aquellos tiempos de tal ignorancia por ahora mando a todos toda parte que no se arrepienten él ha fijado por medio del hombre me ha imaginado de ellos una prueba a todos levantando entre los muertos Jake. Dear God, you sent Paul to the Athenians to share his knowledge of you. We're grateful for Jake, who will share with us. Bless us and him through the message he brings. The 
we've <clears throat> maybe never learned to speak a second language, I think we've all learned other languages, right? Maybe uh, we see this especially with our parents, probably. Uh, for me, it was growing up uh, loving basketball. Uh, my parents would do everything that they could to kind of like foster this inside of me. Um, they would take me to basketball games. One, one spring break, we went down to New Mexico so we could watch the regional semifinals of the national uh, tournament. So I got to go down, and they have this cool pit in New Mexico. It's called the pit, where we watched Purdue and Wisconsin and Louisiana play. And they would come to all my games. My mom would wear this like little button that she had made with my picture on it, which was probably pretty embarrassing at the time, but also maybe liked it a little bit that my mom was there. Uh, to this day, I don't think they could distinguish between a travel and a double dribble or know what the charity stripe is or what and one means, but they were always there. right? And for my brother, it was taking him to guitar stores so that he could practice and play on different acoustic guitars. And it was uh, helping him buy uh, guitar strings, it seemed like, every other week. Or going to Phil Kagey concerts, this really good fingerstyle guitarist that my brother loved. We kind of learned this maybe as, as parents or as friends. Um, currently, I have learned to play uh, a card game called Exploding Kittens. I've become really good at a video game called Ultimate Chicken Horse. Not things that I would have normally aspired to on my own volition, but uh, when you have children, you, you do things to, to speak their language, right? Though we've never maybe learned to speak a second language, we've all learned other languages for the sake of connection and for love, right? So what languages have you learned for the sake of love? What languages have other people learned to speak for your sake? Perhaps it's not surprising that one of the, the first signs of the Holy Spirit's power and presence in the New Testament was the ability to speak in someone else's native tongue. Two weeks ago, we got to see or learn about a blinded man who regained his sight. And he received the Holy Spirit in that same moment. And in that moment, two enemies became friends when Ananias turned to his persecutor and called him Brother Saul. We now call him Saint Paul, right? The apostle to the Gentiles, or as Malcolm Geith would say, an enemy whom God has made friend, last to believe and first for God to send. Thrown to the ground and raised that same moment, a prisoner who set his captors free, a naked man with love his only garment, a blinded man who helped the world to see. Paul, no doubt, would have been multilingual, right? Knowing probably Greek, Aramaic, and scribal Hebrew. But I think his greatest linguistic strength was not these, but rather translating the Jewish story into the language or the vernacular of the Gentiles. And nowhere do we find this sort of like linguistic power on display better than his address to the Areopagus at Athens. Now, as you probably noticed, if you've read your Bibles recently, your New Testament does not contain first and second Athenians, right? We've got all sorts of other books, but no church was established in Athens. There weren't follow-up letters like there was to the Thessalonians or the Corinthians or the Ephesians and the Colossians. There is no first and second Athenians. And though it had this like, prominent place in the ancient world, and though it was sort of this distinguished place on Paul's journey in the New Testament, it's just sort of this like parenthesis in the book of Acts. And it seems to bear little narrative connection to the rest of the New Testament. And yet, Luke leaves it in there. It's there for a reason. There must be something important about it. And maybe it's not so much that there was a church that was started there, that there were thousands or tens of thousands of people converted after Paul's sermon. Quite the opposite. So maybe it's less about powerful impact and more about the beauty of patient persuasion. What sort of instruction do we find there? Well, let's unpack it 
a little bit and for our context too. So Athens, for Paul, was kind of a, a forced detour. How many of you love coming across those orange and black signs when you're driving that have a little arrow and they say detour on it? Right? Carol's shaking her head. She's like, no. If you're going to work or even if you're on vacation, if you see that, and you, especially if you don't know where you are and how to get back on the right track, that is a very unnerving sign. Even with our modern GPSs, right? Have you all ever heard the when you have to take a detour? Proceed to the route. Proceed to the route. Like, I want to proceed to the route. I don't know where it is. Shush. Um, we can all, I think, resonate with that. So Paul is only in Athens because he's on a detour. He had to flee from Thessalonica. Then he had to flee from Berea. They, they took him here to Athens kind of as, as this emergency escape route for Paul. And he's waiting there for his buddies, Timothy and Silas, who had stayed back in Berea. And Paul just gets dropped off in Athens alone. And so our passage starts off with this really interesting phrase where it just says, while Paul was waiting for them. While Paul was waiting for them. What if we took your name and inserted it for Paul's name there? While you were waiting for them. How would you finish that phrase? Uh, if you're like me, sitting around waiting is probably not on your favorite hobbies list. Right? Probably right up there maybe with taking detours. These aren't the types of things that we like to do, especially nowadays. I feel like our culture is not accustomed to waiting. We want to be constantly entertained, constantly distracted, constantly consuming. Amazon delivers faster and faster. They can like bring you stuff in a day now if you have certain forms of Amazon Prime. Uh, new music is always at your fingertips. You can just download it through the air. Uh, some of you may remember when we were younger how you had to come across music, right? If you wanted to find new music or you heard new music, you had to listen to the radio. And if you missed the name or the, of the song on the radio, you had to sit down and just wait around until it came on again. And, and you wait for it and wait for it. And you're just like, please say the name. Please say the name after the song. And finally, you hear the name of the song. And then you have to maybe drive you know, 45 minutes like I did to a CD store, a music store, and figure out what genre it was. Was this alternative? Was it rock? And then you rifle through the sections. And finally, maybe you come across the CD that you were looking for. Like that was our, that was our process. Now you just download it out of the air. Unbelievable. Different times. But we're not accustomed to waiting. How are you at waiting? Do you like waiting for things? What would you do in Paul's shoes? How did Paul sit and wait? It said, while Paul was waiting for them, he walked around the city and his spirit was provoked or stirred. It's kind of like a, a mixing was stirred within him because the city was full of idols. So for Paul, the very first thing he did when he was waiting was that he spent time watching. He spent time observing. He spent time seeking to understand his context. Or in another way of phrasing it, Paul spent his time listening. Listening. Now, if this passage is at all, I think, exemplary for us, this is Luke's first message and primary message to us. When life gives you detours and you're forced to wait, watch and observe and listen. Perhaps God is seeking to stir your spirit within you. Through the detour and through the waiting. And so maybe put down your phone for a while or your entertainments or your distractions and just listen for a bit. Now, clearly, Paul doesn't stay just in listening mode. We know he goes on to engage. His spirit is stirred, and so he engages. But it's interesting that the posture of listening, even in his engagement, goes on to shape how he interacts in Athens. So ultimately, Paul's heart is stirred because he sees the hearts of the Athenians being stirred. They're searching. They're looking for something. 
There's two things we need to know about Athens. The first is that Athens is to sort of like the Greek religious practices, the Greek pantheon. Athens is to that what Vatican City is to Catholicism. It's the, the center of it all. It's the, the hub of it all. There was this, this old uh, satirical writer named Petronius who said this about Athens. Maybe a bit of an overstatement, but this is what he said. He said, it's easier to find a god than a man in Athens. That's how, that's how prolific the temples and the gods were in the city. It's easier to find a god than a man in Athens. Perhaps in our context, we could say it's easier to find a product than a person in the West, right? Something similar to, to what we struggle with here. So that's the first thing. Athens is to Greek religious practice what the Vatican is to Catholicism. The second is this. Athens is to philosophy, the love of wisdom this learning of knowledge, Athens is to philosophy what Nashville is to music, right? This, this, this is the place where it happens. This is, this is the home of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, just a few minor philosophers in history, right? This is, this is a central location for philosophy and the love of wisdom. It said in our passage, maybe you caught it, Luke puts in this little parenthetical phrase, they spent their time doing nothing other than just talking about the latest stuff, <laughs> the newest ideas, that this is what they loved to do. So in Athens, the Athenians were religiously fervent. You could barely find more people than gods in Athens. Religiously fervent and intellectually hungry. They were a people who were seeking, a people who were searching, a people who were longing, and Paul was moved by their longing. Paul's spirit was stirred by their spirit's stirrings. How about you? Are you stirred by the stirrings of others? What do you see in their efforts and in their idols? What do you see in their addictions and in their insecurities? Do you see these things as a grasping after God? Simone Ville, the famous French philosopher, wrote, one has only the choice between God and idolatry. She says there's no other option before us because the faculty of worship is in us. And so that worship will either be directed into this world or into another world. We only have the choice between God and idolatry. St. Augustine famously put it this way, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. This truth, or something inherent in these quotes, this truth moved Paul, and so he listened, and he observed, and then he spoke, and he persuaded. And the words that came from him were probably similar to or echoed in a similar way as the words from Hamlet. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt in your philosophy. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And so Paul connects their stirrings with the grand stir of things. The creator, he says, put signposts in creation, these borders and boundaries and limits, he says, so that you would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. And this, I think, is one of the central messages of Paul's statement, that God is not far from any one of us. Do you believe this about all others? Do you believe that everyone's heart is stirring and restless within them? Do you believe that God is not far from any one of us? 
And Paul, he, he won't drop this point. This is how important it is. He won't drop this point. In fact, he, he bolsters it with supporting quotations. Those of you who are thankful to be well beyond the years of writing research papers and things, those of us that don't love the academic sphere like our brother Jamie back there, uh, we're, we're glad to be beyond that. But during that time, you probably remember how it works with research writing or when you're trying to persuade people of things, you have to offer evidence. You have to give sort of quotations or, or things that would build up and support your argument. And this is how Paul does it. Though, though he's obviously speaking this richly Jewish message, he never quotes the Hebrew scriptures at all because he's not speaking to a Jewish audience. So instead, he quotes Greek poets and Stoic philosophers, right? The kinds of people that they would know, the kinds of people that they would have heard of. And he says things like, we are God's offspring, and in him we live and move and have our being. Very Jewish, but very contextualized within a, a Greek philosophical context. Paul's been listening, right? Paul's been observing. He's noting where God has been drawing near. How about you? Could you quote someone else's songs and poems? Have you listened well enough? Have you seen God already at work stirring in other people's hearts? And could you point to those places where God is clearly stirring? Or most importantly, could you take the vague outline of the unknown God and color it in richly with the contours of Jesus? Can you take the vague outline of the unknown God and color it in with the beautiful contours of Jesus? There's points at which we could maybe be persuaded that Paul's approach is a sort of cloudy pluralism, but it's not a cloudy pluralism at all. It's not an all roads lead to God kind of accommodation. It's a recognition that everyone is on a road and that everyone is traveling and everyone is searching and everyone is grasping. But the only road that leads us home, says Paul, is the road that leads us to Jesus. George MacDonald said this, Jesus Christ is the way out and the way in from every slavery, conscious or unconscious, into liberty. He is the journey from the unhomeliness of things to the home that we desire but do not know. There once was a man named Paul, an apostle to the Gentile who knew this truth really well. He was an enemy whom God had made friend, last to believe, and first for God to send. A Jew who was made perfect in the law, but came to bless the flesh of every other race. And he helped them to see what the apostles saw, the glory of the Lord in Jesus' face. So may you, like Paul, have the ears to hear and the words to speak, to guide those restless hearts home to rest in Jesus. May you be able to hear and embrace these words from Isaiah for you and to make them Perhaps your, your morning mantra as you go out into the world. These are the world, words spoken of the suffering servant who would come, but I think these are words that, like Paul, we can take upon ourselves. It says this, The sovereign Lord has given you a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary he wakens you morning by morning, wakens your ear like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened your ears. The sovereign Lord 
has given you a well-instructed tongue to know the words that sustain the weary. He wakens you morning by morning as one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened your ears. May it be so. Amen. response, we'll be turning to number 422, called or not called. The additional verses um, are down at the bottom. Uh, because it's a new song, the singing group will sing the first two verses, including known or unknown. And then if you look at the bottom, uh, the third verse is seen or unseen, and the fourth is named or unnamed. What spoke to you in this service? What joys and concerns would you share? Please be brief and focused. <clears throat> 